Hi everybody, Scott here, and this is a quick video about an APC UPS. Well, maybe not that quick, but we'll see. It's the SURTA3000XL to be precise, which is a 120 volt 3000 VA double conversion online UPS. This beast weighs in at 120 pounds, boasts half an hour of runtime at 50% load, and that's still at over 1000 watts, retails for $2300 and contains enough batteries to choke a horse or probably any other animal, I guess. Uh, maybe not an elephant, though. In this video, I'm going to be, shall we say, refurbishing a couple of old battery modules with fresh batteries and testing out the UPS. See, I got this UPS in working condition from a rather reputable eBay seller, but it won't power on without batteries, so I haven't been able to test it. The batteries arrived today, and so if you want to see a guy in a basement shove batteries into a UPS, then this video is for you. Here on the table, I of course have some batteries. One of the reasons that this UPS weighs so much is that it takes 16, that's right, 16 batteries. I got those on eBay, and the reason I went with Sigmas Tech over like PowerSonic or some other brand is because I've seen other people use them in this type of APC UPS before. Maybe they suck, I guess only time will tell, but I hope they'll last at least a few years. Next comes the battery trays, or sleds, or modules, or whatever. Uh, regardless, they're the metal cases that hold the batteries. I also got these on eBay, used, because the seller of the UPS didn't provide them. I'm not knocking the seller, they said no batteries, and I kind of assumed I wouldn't be getting the trays, but I didn't order these until after the UPS arrived, just in case. And the final part of this whole shebang is the UPS itself. I mean, the rest of this crap would be pretty useless otherwise. Um, so I'll just get the cord all set for its YouTube debut, and there we go. Oh yeah, and I'll need a screwdriver and a pair of scissors. Okay, uh, one thing the seller disclosed in the auction is that the display panel was held on with tape. It wasn't a really good tape job either, but hopefully everything is intact electrically. Now with the decorative cover off, I can remove the battery cover. It's just a metal plate with two Phillips screws, and then the cover, um, well, kind of slides down and flips out. There we go. I'll admit, I've never put one of these UPSs together before, and that is the exact wrong way to put the battery modules in. This thing is probably rack mounted in the vast majority of cases, and so they designed the batteries to go in sideways, which is to say right side up when the UPS is horizontal. But give me a break on this, because I'm standing behind the damn thing. I just wanted to show you the UPS, but I'll put it away for the time being in order to get to work on the batteries. These modules, or trays, or whatever they're called, are very easy to disassemble. Two Phillips screws hold the cover in place, and it just slides over to release. Inside there are these two plastic dealies, I'll show you what those are for later, a bunch of small jumpers to interconnect the batteries, and the leads that go from the batteries to the UPS itself. Here's a third one of those battery trays. Um, I only need two, but I found a seller that had a lot of four at the same price as two of them were selling at, uh, at most other places. Plus, I wouldn't mind getting my hands on another Serta 3000 XL, so they might come in handy yet. Anyway, I'm cracking this one open because the battery jumpers were all mixed up between the four units and I need some uh, additional ones. So now that I have my pile of wires, it's time to open this box of batteries. On the side of the box it says that the weight is about 31 pounds. It's not that heavy, but the density is really high so it feels incredibly heavy, uh, if you know what I mean and it's going to take two of these boxes to fill the UPS, so you can see that about half of its 120 pound weight comes from just the batteries. In fact, you can see that the box itself didn't fare all that well in transit. It's a little crushed in on the side there. That and the batteries really chewed the hell out of the styrofoam packaging. These little styrofoam bits are just everywhere, politely stuck where they are due to our good old friend's static electricity. In fact, they're a huge pain in the ass and got stuck under all the terminals. I'm going to be finding those little pieces of shit everywhere for weeks. Anyway, there's the eight batteries all lined up nicely, and here's a close-up of the specs in case you were wondering. They should match the original APC parts exactly, from what I understand, and they're made in, um, uh, Vietnam. I didn't bother looking up how the batteries go into the tray or how they're wired, and that's because it became immediately apparent from the layout of the leads. The short lead here will only reach the black terminal if the first battery is in that exact position. Then, since half the jumpers have connectors that are bent over backwards on themselves, they must connect two terminals that are back to back. The other jumpers are straight and just the right length to connect two batteries with their terminals far apart. 
And since the batteries can only be wired in series given the supplies on hand, it's always black to red, or positive to negative if you prefer. So here's how the batteries lay out in case you were doing this for yourself. Very simple pattern, front to front and ass to ass. <gasps> okay, and here's the wiring in detail. I'll speed it up a little though and show you the finished arrangement at the end. By the way, I realized that I'd forgotten this big fat jumper. I'm assuming that it's a thermal cutout so that if the battery pack overheats, the voltage is disconnected. It seems to fit just right in the middle of the pack, and I figure that's the best place for it if it's a thermal, thermal whatever majig. The long UPS lead is bent in a particular way, and there's a little spacer on the bottom of the tray between the four batteries on the right and the four on the left. So I'm assuming that it's meant to tuck between them and then follow out the other side to the open terminal at the back. And it seems to work out anyway. And so here's the finished thing. Again, it's all in series, so as long as you connect red to black over and over again, you'll be fine. Now, I was going to show you the voltage, but in my haste I set my meter to AC and got no reading. But have no fear, I'll redeem myself later and show you the voltage of the pack and the individual batteries. Um, the batteries weren't fully charged, but nearly so. The plastic dealies from before slip over the battery terminals and the jumpers in order to insulate them from the metal case. Of course, all the terminals have the plastic connectors on them, but I like that APC went with the belt and suspenders approach in case a connector pops off or something. The cover is indented in the middle here and touches the tops of the batteries to hold them in place. Getting it on is a bit tricky because it uses these little tabs which don't line up perfectly with the sides of the case. The sides tend to bow out uh, quite a bit in the middle. But have no fear, when push comes to shove in the electronics world, just pound on your device with the back of a screwdriver and all will be well. Now that the cover is seated, the screws go back in and this module appears to be complete. I had already stuffed the batteries into the second module. I did that back at the office and made a tremendous mess there with the styrofoam. Uh, whoops. It gets wired up in the exact same way, and by now I had realized my mistake with the meter, amateur as it was, and found that four of the batteries together gave me 52 volts, meaning that all eight will yield 104 volts, because of course wiring batteries in series makes their voltages additive. The connectors on these jumpers are of very high quality, by the way. They actually click into the terminals in a nice, satisfying way. Okay, so once I got good contact, uh, we see, yep, about 104 volts all told. And just to make sure that there's continuity all the way through, there it is at the plug. The UPS should keep them at a float of about 13.5-ish volts each, and dividing 104 by 8 shows that these shipped with a nearly full charge at 13 volts. APC says that the DC side of the UPS operates at 192 volts, which equates to 16 12 nominal volt batteries wired in series. But as you can see, it'll be closer to 216 volts at a full charge. By the way, if you're going to be refurbing a UPS like this, be really, really careful. I mean really careful. This pack puts out a max of 108 volts DC at full charge and can drive a current of about 14 amps. Not only could that lead to a very lengthy stay in the mortuary, but it can also make for a quite exciting house fire if you manage to dead short the thing. So I wouldn't necessarily recommend inferring the connections like I did, but you can trust YouTube simply because I'm not dead at this point. Otherwise, check the manufacturer's website for wiring diagrams, which they won't have, or look for pictures of the original stock battery pack wiring on Google Images or something. Hey, that's more than enough don't try this at home nonsense for now. You should totally try this at home. Uh, replacement batteries from APC cost a fortune. I think that these trays might have had a bit of a rough life between their original installation and my basement, because things don't line up quite right. But with them both finally put together, it's time for the moment of truth. Will this UPS work? I really don't know at this point in the video. So the UPS is back on the bench with its pathetic looking display hanging off like a kid's head on a noodle neck, or, or some better analogy. Um, since that was bothering me, I decided to waste my time reaffixing it to a possibly busted UPS. But here's a pro tip for you, or at least a meh tip. Duct tape is better than duct tape for situations like this. What I mean is that the foil tape that I have here is actually meant for sealing ducts. The duct tape that's usually called duct tape should never be used on ducts. Does that make sense? Not a bit, but that's the situation we're all in. The foil tape has a fantastically strong and durable adhesive that won't dry out and crumble over time, 
and obviously the metal will likewise remain unravaged by time. The foil tape also conforms very tightly to the contours of a weird shape like this, and is very thin, so it won't get in the way of the bezel later. I didn't do the neatest job here because that bezel is going to completely cover it, plus I'm a bit lazy, but if you're properly anal retentive with this kind of tape, it can actually yield really good looking results. Even though it's got poor tensile strength and is easily torn, I think it's the best tape for this particular job, bar none. And epoxy or glue were out of the question because this tape will also remove with minimal residue in case I ever want to reorient the display for rack mounting. Okay, back to the action, or whatever it is if you want to call it that. Now that I'm in front of the UPS, I can see that the modules have to go in sideways, so the first one went in pretty smoothly. The second one kept getting held up on these little tabs, and it was then that I realized that they'll probably go in easiest when the UPS is horizontal. Not super easy, but it did get in there. I took care to get the connectors lined up before pushing the packs all the way in because the wires are too short to get them in after. The battery cover gets screwed on, and then it's time for the moment of truth. Uh, well, almost. Since this thing has a rating of 3000 VA and 2100 watts, it can't be plugged into an average 15 or 20 amp branch circuit that you might have around the house. What it really needs is a dedicated circuit rated at 30 amps in a NEMA L530 receptacle. But for testing on the bench, I'm busting out my trusty adapter cable, which has an L530R on one end and a standard North American household 515 plug on the other. And we have some semblance of success. The fan on the front started spinning. And the power button, properly depressed... Tuza! We have life! It looks like this may have been money well spent after all. The UPS goes through a brief test cycle, but seems to wind up in a good state in the end. The only troubling thing about it is a slight buzzing, like this. That I first thought was caused by the fan, but it turns out to be some component in the back. Uh, hopefully it's not a bad transformer or something like that, but it's an investigation for another day. For now, I'll test it out a little more. Output from the back of the UPS, now with the meter properly set to AC mode, shows a hair over 120 volts, which is just about perfect. Now I'll plug my trusty kilowatt meter in line with it and check a few more stats. It's reading about 100 watts with no load on the UPS. That's due to a combination of the battery charging, running the fan and onboard electronics, plus a little loss to the inverter circuit. I'm going to borrow this lamp from my lighting setup here and add a little load to the mix. It's a 250 watt halogen, but it seems to only draw about 220 watts for a total UPS draw of 324 and 2.8 amps. The uh, particularly attentive among you might have noticed that the voltage was 120 and the watts were 324, which should have been about 2.5 amps, not 2.8. And I'm going to recommend that you look at Wikipedia for a great article on power factor, if that's something that's new to you. This halogen light is a resistive load, and ideally would have a power factor of 1. Inside the UPS is all sorts of electronic circuitry, and will be, in total, a somewhat reactive load. If we assume that the halogen lamp is using 220 watts and 1.83 amps, that means that the UPS is pulling about 104 watts and 0.97 amps, giving it a power factor of about 0.89. Now those numbers aren't exact, because it does seem like the UPS is pulling a little more or less power over time as it pleases, but you can see my math is probably close with a halogen lamp by itself showing 1.79 amps and 218 watts. And yeah, you can see that when I plug the UPS back in without any load attached, it ramps up to pull over 270 watts, and then comes back down to like 30 watts right before I plug the load back in, when it then shows 344 watts. But like I said, the batteries are charging, and the inverter is inverting, so it's a pretty complex load anyhow. So here's what the display panel looks like, uh, once I get it in focus, when there's no incoming utility power. It seems to be working just fine though. But what about the power coming out of the UPS? Here's yet another extension cord, which is long as ass for this purpose. First I'll show you a baseline of what's coming out of my wall. 59.9 Hertz, I think my meter's jacked up and 122.5-ish volts. The UPS is giving off a closer to nominal 120.4 volts and also showing 59.9 hertz, which makes me now almost certain that my meter is having a very minor shit fit. Surely it's 60 hertz even. Weirdly, with the UPS plugged in, it's now outputting 121.1 volts. A double conversion online UPS like this should always give a constant voltage no matter what's going on with the input, 
so I'm not sure why it came up with an extra 0.7 volts or so, but there you have it. Okay, time to put the bezel back on, but weirdly I can't figure out where those battery leads are supposed to go. They almost but not quite clear the back of the bezel, and they can't bend out of the way because of the arrangement of all the parts and pieces around them, so the bezel is on as best as possible right now. And there we have it, one working 3000 VA double conversion online UPS revived from the scrap pile of eBay for just under 500 bucks all in. But wait, just like a shitty infomercial, there's more. I realized that I'd meant to test something else out with the UPS. I said before the DC system in the UPS was rated for 192 volts, which would be the sum of the two battery modules. But could the DC system operate at half the voltage with only one battery pack for redundancy? These modules are supposed to be hot swappable, so I figured it's worth a try. I've got a little purple LED light bulb under the bezel over there for dramatic effect. It's being powered by the UPS, and let's see what happens when I pull one of those batteries. Okay, the light bulb stays lit, but there's a bit of beeping. And with the plug pulled... Oh. Well, I guess it needs both battery modules after all. That's too bad. I didn't show the fault state of the panel with the battery disconnected, so here it is in case you were curious. It's just a blinking red LED and a beep at regular intervals. But the batteries clearly can indeed be hot swapped because they can be reconnected live and the UPS is happy again. One more thing I'd recommend. Label your batteries with their in-service state. This serves two purposes, both of which might be irrelevant to you, so maybe, well, you shouldn't bother after all. But these batteries last about three to five years. If you are serious about reliability, you can preventatively replace the batteries after three years, which will hopefully be before they fail. That's expensive, but can give you a peace of mind. If you choose not to do that, well, at least you know how long the batteries did last when you go to replace them post-mortem. And if you have a lot of UPSs, that can give you some data as to which brands of replacement batteries have proven most reliable. Plus, I just like to know as a matter of curiosity. Oh, I labeled the packs A and B. That's so if I ever need to remove them to move the UPS around, I know which is which. Again, it's really just to satisfy my curiosity about longevity and not for any real useful purpose. Or, if I wanted to be extremely anal, I could preemptively replace one pack 18 months from now and thereafter replace each one on their 3 year anniversary. But that's more of a best practice for a parallel N plus N style battery system and that is something that I can't afford, even used. Well, thanks for watching. If you like this video then rest assured that none of the other videos in my channel are anything like it. But, I, I don't know, I mean you should probably subscribe anyway just in case, right? I won't spam your feed with shitloads of videos uh, because I'm too lazy to churn these out one after another.